Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Michael Richard Swanson? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case, move to the timeline of the murders, then offer my analysis. Michael Richard Swanson was born on May 11, 1993, and was raised in St. Louis Park, Minnesota. This is a suburb of Minneapolis. He lived with his father, Bob, his mother, Kathy, and his two older brothers. From a young age, Michael's behavior was unusual and troubling in many ways. For example, when he was in daycare, he would harass the other children and the daycare provider. Before taking a nap, he would wake everyone up. In addition, he always wanted to escape from the daycare, like it was a prison. Michael's mother, Kathy, decided to open her own daycare in order to earn money and to keep an eye on Michael. On one occasion, when Michael was a toddler, Kathy caught him standing on top of a chair, as if he was preparing to jump on top of an infant who was on the floor. Michael denied any ill intent, but Kathy closed her daycare business and returned to working outside the home. Michael continued to engage in abnormal, and disturbing behaviors. He would come home after playing outside and say that he had been attacked by other children. Michael even had a bloody nose to offer as evidence. Eventually, he admitted that he gave himself a bloody nose to get the attention of his mother. Michael claimed to have recurring nightmares where people would chase him with knives. He would draw pictures which corresponded with these nightmares and featured a man carrying a bloody knife. The nightmares and the drawings went on for years. Michael would regularly wander around the family house at night as if he was restless and looking for trouble. On one occasion, his mother caught him in her bedroom cutting a bar of soap with a knife. At another time, he woke up in the middle of the night and stabbed chairs at the kitchen table. Kathy and Bob placed the knives in locations where they believed Michael could not get them, but he managed to find a knife that was unsecured. In one particularly frightening incident during the early morning hours, Michael held a knife over his brother's head as his brother was in bed. After this, Michael's parents started locking bedroom doors and taking other precautions to keep everyone safe. One time, after Michael threatened a neighbor's child with a knife, his parents took him to a behavioral treatment center. The clinicians informed them that they were being hysterical and Michael's behavior was not a big deal. They were unable to do anything for him. Michael's father, Bob, kept a pistol and money in a safe in the family house. Somehow, Michael gained access to the safe. He took the money and activated the laser sight on the pistol, but did not steal the pistol. The money was used to purchase drugs. Bob became aware of what happened after seeing the laser activated on the pistol. Sometime after this, Michael once again managed to gain access to the safe. This time he took the money that was in there and the pistol. The police were notified and found him at a friend's residence. Michael indicated that he was having thoughts about hurting his mother. Michael was sent to a group home where he was supposed to stay for 30 days. He ended up attacking a staff member with a fire extinguisher. Kathy said the group home kicked him out and recommended that he be turned over to the system. Michael went through the court system and was ordered to pay restitution. The option was available for him to volunteer and earn credit toward what he owed like he could work off his debt instead of paying in cash. He went to work with his aunt, performing community service at a place called Pioneer Park in Annandale, Minnesota. This is a non-profit educational museum which focuses on artifacts from the pioneers of the area. When Michael was there, he stole $250 from the organization. When his aunt confronted him, he denied it, but she ended up finding the money in a place where Michael had hidden it. After this, Michael's aunt made an even more disturbing discovery in the trunk of her car. It contained shotguns that had been owned by her late husband. In addition, in the bed of her four-wheeler, she found handguns, a baseball bat, and a hatchet. It was all too clear that Michael was responsible for positioning all these weapons. Afraid for her safety, Michael's aunt called Kathy to come pick him up. Michael explained his behavior by saying he wanted to rob a Taco Bell restaurant, but his aunt was getting in the way of his plans by denying him use of a vehicle. 
Michael was charged with felony gun theft after this incident and spent 10 days in a juvenile detention center. This was in 2006. He was then ordered to return to his parents' residence under their supervision. Not surprisingly, Michael's behavior problems did not go away. In 2008, a probation officer recommended that Michael go to prison for six to nine months. Unfortunately, the probation officer had a change of heart, telling Michael's mother that sometimes it was worse for a child to be taken out of the home. In April 2010, Michael stole his mother's 2002 Jeep Grand Cherokee, one of the family dogs, and credit cards. He drove south and ended up running out of money seven hours away in St. Joseph, Missouri. Michael called his mother and requested a pickup. In July 2010, he pleaded guilty to motor vehicle theft and was sent to a residential treatment center for adolescent offenders. A mental health professional diagnosed Michael with bipolar disorder and said that Michael was at risk for stealing guns and robbing people. Despite this alarming assessment, Michael was never treated at the facility. Instead, he was released in early November with the advice that he should be enrolled in a mood disorder clinic. Over the next few months, Michael found a job at a store and attended church. He appeared to be improving, but appearances were deceiving. Now moving to the timeline of the murders. On November 15, 2010, 17-year-old Michael Richard Swanson stole his mother's Jeep Grand Cherokee and her debit cards. After this, he went to his grandfather's cabin, broke in, and removed firearms. Michael drove about 165 miles south to Algona, Iowa, and entered a Crossroads convenience store at 9 p.m. The cashier on duty was a 47-year-old woman named Vicki Bowman Hall. Michael produced a Beretta semi-automatic pistol chambered in 40 caliber S&W, pointed it at Vicki, and demanded cash and cigarettes. After Vicki complied with Michael's commands, he shot her. She did not survive. Michael then drove 25 miles south to Humboldt, Iowa, and entered a come-and-go convenience store at 10.30 p.m. Just as he had done earlier, Michael robbed the store. He pointed the gun at the 61-year-old cashier, Sheila Myers, and placed a bag on the table. After she put cigarettes and $31 in cash in the bag, Michael shot and killed her. Witnesses described the vehicle that Michael was driving to the police, he was spotted in Webster City, about 41 miles southeast of Humboldt. An employee at a McDonald's restaurant noticed him in the drive through The police arrived and arrested Michael without incident. Michael unwisely agreed to talk to the police and confessed to both murders. When talking about the murder of Sheila Myers, Michael said, quote, I felt powerful. I just didn't care, unquote. He indicated that his adrenaline was pumping and he was feeling good. He said, quote, I just feel like sometimes people get shot, unquote. Michael was charged with two counts of first-degree murder and two counts of first-degree robbery. He pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. In June of 2011, he was convicted of first-degree murder and first-degree robbery in connection with the death of Sheila Myers. The sentence for the murder charge was mandatory, life in prison without the possibility of parole. Michael eventually pleaded guilty in connection with Vicky's murder as well, and received a second mandatory life sentence. In 2013, the governor of Iowa commuted Michael's sentence to 60 years in prison. In November of 2014, Michael was charged with attempted murder in prison after attacking another inmate. In 2015, he was convicted and sentenced to an additional 25 years. Michael Swanson will be eligible for parole in 2089 at the age of 96. Now moving to my analysis. Here are my thoughts on a few areas that stood out to me in this case. Item number one. Throughout his early years, Michael was diagnosed by various mental health clinicians. The diagnoses included bipolar disorder, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, and oppositional defiant disorder. Michael's mother, Kathy, suggested that when she went to mental health clinicians, she was looking for behavioral strategies for him, but she never received any meaningful advice. Some clinicians viewed Michael as a troublemaker whose behavior did not deviate that far from normal. Other clinicians believed that Michael's mental health symptoms were so pronounced that he was beyond all hope. For example, when he was 11 years old, a mental health clinician told his mother that he was a lost cause and needed to be locked away in a secure facility. 
The same dichotomy, as far as assessment, was reflected during Michael's trial. Some mental health professionals said that he had no underlying mental disorder. Others claimed that he had a long-standing mental disorder that was extremely serious. Item number two, Michael's parents lived in fear and frustration for much of the time when he lived with them. At various times, he admitted to having thoughts about harming his mother, aunt, and grandmother. At one point, all of Michael's clothing was locked in a room, and he was made to wear a towel with a safety pin on it. This was because he was always trying to run away from the residence. His mother figured that Michael would not want to be seen running around wearing only a towel. As far as the safety concerns, the interior doors of the residence were locked at night, and his parents kept a large pipe wrench in their bedroom in case they needed to defend themselves. This is an odd choice when a firearm is available, but maybe they wanted to keep their options open, like that way they could be prepared for a pipe fitting emergency as well. If parents feel compelled to keep any type of self-defense instrument on hand to protect themselves from their son, then clearly there are serious problems that need to be addressed. Unfortunately, the mental health clinicians in this case did not have the will or ability to offer any meaningful assistance. As grim as it is, the clinician who assessed Michael as a lost cause was correct. Michael's parents were in a terrible position. If they turned Michael over to the system, people would have criticized them and suggested that they abandon him unfairly. If they continued to raise him and he did something horrible, they would get blamed for not taking action to stop him. Based on the inconsistent and conflicting advice they received, it looks like Michael's parents did the best they could under the terrible circumstances. Their situation wasn't as clear-cut as it may have appeared. For example, there were times when Michael's behavior improved. Item number three. In a note that Michael wrote to his mother from prison, he indicated how happy he was to finally be prescribed lithium for bipolar disorder. He said that if a person needs to get medication for bipolar disorder and they are under 18, they need to kill somebody to cause a media sensation and get put in prison. Michael made it seem as though the entire problem with his behavior was based on how nobody treated his mental health symptoms. Yet, he attempted to murder someone in prison even after being treated. Item number four, there are many different theories about Michael's mental health symptoms. Was his problem rooted in personality pathology like psychopathy? Could bipolar disorder explain his behavior? There's no way to know for sure, but some of his behavior aligned with psychopathic traits. For example, he was manipulative, excitement-seeking, fearless, impulsive, irresponsible, committed crimes, lied constantly, had early behavioral problems, and had a lack of empathy and remorse. Michael did not appear to respond to punishment, which is one of the most worrisome signs when evaluating a risk of future offenses. He also thought that killing people was funny. Michael just couldn't stop laughing after being arrested. He even laughed when he was convicted of murder. Not surprisingly, Michael's murder is hysterical position did not win him any sympathy. If Michael really did have bipolar disorder, this would have only amplified his level of dangerousness. Now the impulsivity, excitement-seeking, and fearlessness would be combined with feelings of euphoria, boundless energy, and unstable mood. Whatever was going on with Michael, one thing is for certain. The mental health clinicians in this case once again demonstrated the limitations of assessment and treatment. This brings me to my final item, number five. One of the most controversial components of this case is the idea that Michael was beyond redemption. Is it possible that some young offenders really do represent a lost cause, as one mental health clinician indicated in this case? Here's how I look at this. In the mental health field, there is wide acceptance for the idea that conditions can permanently limit some type of behavior. For example, an individual with pronounced fear can't be a skydiver. A person with chronic social anxiety can't make sales presentations to large groups of people, and someone who always tells the truth can't be a politician. Even though mental health clinicians try to address symptoms and often achieve great success, it is important to be realistic about what type of progress can be made. When it comes to the idea of a chronic offender, however, clinicians are reluctant to make the same type of declaration, especially if the offender is young. Few clinicians are willing to say, this person is dangerous and will need long-term mental health treatment. My opinion is that clinicians must make decisions based on scientific evidence. 
First and foremost, they should offer their honest evaluation, which includes noting its limitations. With that in mind, most of the time when young people misbehave, they don't turn into killers later in life. I don't know if anyone should ever be declared a lost cause, but it's fair to say that some young people should receive intense mental health treatment for a long time. Michael clearly communicated many times that he wanted to harm people, but the system kept giving him the benefit of the doubt. Ultimately, he demonstrated how the cost of ignoring antisocial symptoms can be catastrophic. Those are my thoughts in the case of Michael Richard Swanson. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.